Enceladus. Obama, I, do Barack, solemnly swear, I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear that I will execute the office of President to the United States faithfully. That I will execute the off faithfully the, pres the office of President of the, the United States. The office of President of the United States faithfully. And will, to the best of my ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you, God. So help me, God. Congratulations, Mr. President. All the best wishes. But the fall of Ramadi has galvanized the Iraqi government. So with the additional steps I ordered last month, we're speeding up training of. ISIL forces, including volunteers from Sunni tribes in Anbar province. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do I, Barack, solemnly swear. I, Barack Hussein Obama, do solemnly swear that I will execute the office of president to the United States faithfully. That I will execute the off faithfully the president office of president of the, the United States. Of president of the United States faithfully. So, with the additional steps I ordered last month, we're speeding up training of. ISIL forces, including volunteers from Sunni tribes in Anbar province. First things I'm going to do is call in my attorney general and say to him or her, I want you to review every executive order that's been issued by George Bush. I think one of the biggest problems of the last eight years has been the degree to which President Bush has taken almost the opposite tack, that uh, secrecy and uh, concentrations of power in the Oval Office uh, and a disdain to some degree for uh, public opinion has, um, has left the American people feeling like they have no influence over their government. I taught the Constitution for 10 years. I believe in the Constitution and I will obey the Constitution of the United States. We're not going to use signing statements as a way of doing an end run around Congress. All right. I've got a pen and I've got a phone uh, and I can use that pen to sign executive orders. Where I can act on my own without Congress, I'm going to do so. But I'm also going to act on my own uh, if uh, Congress is deadlocked. I've got a pen and I've got a phone, and that's all I need. So with the additional steps I ordered last month, we're speeding up training of ISIL forces, including volunteers from Sunni tribes in Anbar province. I, George Walker Bush. I, George Walker Bush. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. <laughs> Just this week, our military forces announced the capture of one of Al-Qaeda's top Iraqi leaders. He helped to form what Al-Qaeda calls the Islamic State in Iraq, an attempt to replicate what the Taliban had created in Afghanistan. So with the additional steps I ordered last month, we're speeding up training of ISIL forces, including volunteers from Sunni tribes in Anbar province. Just this week, our military forces announced the capture of one of Al-Qaeda's top Iraqi leaders. He helped to form what Al-Qaeda calls the Islamic State in Iraq, an attempt to replicate what the Taliban had created in Afghanistan. Is the United States supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? The answer is yes. Fact number one. There is no question that Al-Qaeda fighters are part of the opposition forces attempting to overthrow Syria's government. Fact number two, the creation of Al-Qaeda wasn't Islamic fundamentalism, it was the CIA. The Mujahideen was created by the CIA to cause problems for the Soviets. And you might say that's crazy talk, right? Here's Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. To be, to be fair, we had helped to create the problem we're now fighting. How? Because when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, 
we had this brilliant idea that we were going to come to Pakistan and create a force of Mujahideen, equip them with Stinger missiles and everything else to go after the Soviets inside Afghanistan. And we were successful. The Soviets left Afghanistan. And then we said, great, goodbye, leaving these trained people who were fanatical in Afghanistan and Pakistan, leaving them well armed, creating a mess, frankly, that uh, at the time we didn't really recognize. We were just so happy to see the Soviet Union fall, and we thought, okay, fine, we're, we're okay now. Everything's going to be so much better. Now you look back, the people we're fighting today, we were supporting in the fight against the Soviets. Ah, uh, so it's not a conspiracy theory, it's history, and it's history that's being repeated. We also have a history of kind of moving in and out of Pakistan. I mean, let's remember here, the people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. And we did it because we were locked in this struggle with the Soviet Union. They invaded Afghanistan, and we did not want to see them control Central Asia. And we went to work. And it was President Reagan, in partnership with the Congress, um, led by Democrats, who said, you know what, sounds like a pretty good idea. Let's deal with the ISI and the Pakistani military, and let's go recruit these Mujahideen, and let's great, let's get some to come from Saudi Arabia and other places, importing their Wahhabi brand of Islam so that we can go beat the Soviet Union. And we, guess what? They retreated. They lost billions of dollars, and it led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So there's a, a very strong argument, which is wasn't a bad investment to end the Soviet Union, but let's be careful what we sow because we will harvest. And we now are making up for a lot of lost time. So what you need to know tonight is heavy. Our government is bombing sites around the world in an ongoing war with Al-Qaeda. In Iraq, where Al-Qaeda had no presence before the U.S. war, Al-Qaeda is now thriving. The same Al-Qaeda, yes, created by the U.S. government in order to harm the Soviets. And today, at least 13,000 civilians in Afghanistan are dead as a result of that war with Al-Qaeda. So with all respect to Ms. Fitzgerald from the Irish Times, this is not propaganda. Rather, it is the question that every American should be demanding answers on from Congress and from this president. Why are we giving al-Qaeda fighters money and weapons to overthrow yet another government in the Middle East? Today, our government claims they're freeing the people of Syria. Tomorrow, if history tells us anything, we will be killing and wounding civilians in airstrikes and then referring to them as collateral damage in a war with an enemy who we brought to power. Our nation deserves a serious debate about Iraq because the outcome of this conflict will have enormous consequences for our country. Failure in Iraq would allow terrorists to operate from a safe haven with access to the world's third largest oil reserves. Our main enemy is Al-Qaeda and its affiliates. Their allies choose their victims indiscriminately. Fact number one, there is no question that Al-Qaeda fighters are part of the opposition forces attempting to overthrow Syria's government. Fact number two, the creation of Al-Qaeda wasn't Islamic fundamentalism. It was the CIA. The Mujahideen was created by the CIA to cause problems for the Soviets. To be, to be fair, we had helped to create the problem we're now fighting. How? Because when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, we had this brilliant idea that we were going to come to Pakistan and create a force of Mujahideen, equip them with Stinger missiles and everything else to go after the Soviets inside Afghanistan. And we were successful. The Soviets left Afghanistan. And then we said, great, goodbye, leaving these trained people who were fanatical in Afghanistan and Pakistan, leaving them well armed, creating a mess, frankly, that uh, at the time we didn't really recognize. We were just so happy to see the Soviet Union fall. And we thought, OK, fine, we're, we're OK now. Everything's going to be so much better. Now you look back. The people we're fighting today, we were supporting in the fight against the Soviet. They murder the innocent to advance a focused and clear ideology. They seek to establish a radical Islamic caliphate so they can impose a brutal new order on unwilling people. The interesting thing about the Iraq debate, by the way, 
is I don't hear a lot of discussions about happens if we fail. What happens if we fail? But there needs to be a serious discussion about what happens if we create a vacuum into which radical movements flow. If you're worried about Iran, then I, it's really important that people understand the consequences of us leaving before the job is done. Today, our government claims they're freeing the people of Syria. Tomorrow, if history tells us anything, we will be killing and wounding civilians in airstrikes and then referring to them as collateral damage in a war with an enemy who we brought to power. I am deeply concerned about what would happen in the Middle East should America's credibility be diminished as a result of us not keeping our word, as a result of us abandoning millions of people who are anxious to live in a stable, secure, free society. Once again, we've seen an outrageous attempt to terrorize innocent civilians. This is an attack not just on Paris, it's an attack not just on the people of France, uh, but this is an attack on all of humanity and the universal values that we share.